senior speaker here is uh, a man named Henry Heffernan. Yeah. And, uh, Henry goes back to the days that Mumps was actually being developed at uh, Mass General Hospital, the funding. And he's always been this uh, eminence behind the curtain. He's not, not the front man for anything, but uh, he knows what's going on. He's had the vision. He worked with Ted O'Neill very closely. And uh, in order to recognize that, so this is an award for laying the tracks on the Underground Railroad, uh, yes. presented to Henry Heffernan, September 3rd. So, Henry, you want to say a few words? Well, yeah. Well, you know, the, the idea of the Underground Railroad where these were uh, slaves in the South mm -hmm. who uh, to seek to seek freedom uh, worked together with other cooperating people to provide this route from the South up to the North where they they would be free. Uh, so uh, that concept fit the. The people who started out uh, building the VA system, because uh, they were very, very definitely slaves to the overmasters. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's where the analogy fits. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is that there were a lot of people along the way who saw what was happening and uh, provided shelter for people as they went along. But of course, some were, uh, uh, some were caught and prosecuted, so to speak. And, um, uh, but that's, uh, in a sense, the, the uh, historical background, I think, of the concept that, that the Underground Railroad uh, did resonate as uh, sort of a, a subsequent historical uh, pattern that, that fit. Uh, and, um, uh, but that be, uh, I didn't come prepared to, to give a historical synopsis. So um, it has to be written though. Someone has to write, write it. And Tom here is, uh, certainly has uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the facts. I don't think there's any, anyone who not only is living at the present time or lived in the past who knew all the facts because there were so many individuals who contributed. And if, if there's any one sort of idea that um, uh, Ted O'Neill had in his mind, and that was that um, uh, the, the whole concept of software, you develop a product and you get paid for it. And then if the person wants a change, he comes back and you will make that change for a price. Uh, you know, fundamental business, uh, business model. Uh, well, it turns out that, um, first of all, number one, the doctors don't always necessarily know what they need so that uh, you really can't sit down with a doctor because the doctor will explain something probably lapsing into uh, theory, to technical language of doctors and the software developer nods, nods, and nods and then <laughs> after, after the explanation says, uh, but now what do you want? You know? <laughs> so, um, but I mean, historically that, that really was happening in fact, there, there, there's a paper written by a, a doctor, a Dr. Post, I think his name was, um, who actually wrote this up. He said, this is uh, uh, doctors being approached by computer people. There, there's no communication going on because the, uh, uh, the way the doctors explain things, 
the computer people can't understand or can't match that. So part of the motivation early on, uh, Ted O'Neill was smart enough um, as uh, he knew programming, he knew marketing, uh, he was able to grasp that um, uh, there, there are no requirements uh, in a technical sense that software developers. Uh, there is, if you want, the experience that a doctor needs here and now, and uh, matching that experience, having a software system that's flexible enough to uh, very quickly match that need. Uh, and then, uh, but once a doctor has that, uh, the doctor thinks of the next step, which is a change or an evolution. So uh, the whole model that software development, uh, and the business model, simply wasn't fitting the needs of, of, the, of medical people. And, uh, uh, and that, uh, I think, is, is the fundamental uh, uh, understanding that was needed. And fortunately, Ted O'Neill could understand that. And uh, so the whole point was, well, what's out there that we can latch on to? And Monks was, uh, it was the Department of Health and Human Services that actually funded the National Bureau of Standards to uh, develop a standard for this. Uh, whether they call it months or not was sort of immaterial. It's just that the, uh, these innovative people up there at M MIT grads working at Mass General Hospital uh, had a system that would enable a doctor to say, I need this. And a programmer would say, here it is. Uh, and that was months, that, that capability. So that is that was perceived as what would meet that need of, of physicians. A second element in the business model in, in software in general uh, is that um, uh, this becomes, the, the issue then is, well, this code that I've developed, uh, uh, since you paid me to develop it, well, then you can use it. I will license it to you, but then any change would come back to me and I mm -hmm. uh, correct that. Well, that didn't fit a doctor because a doctor, uh, uh, a doctor can, for the most part, can never predict uh, what condition in a patient is going to come through his door. Uh, but he has to be able to respond in a professional manner to whoever comes to him, uh, referred to him, or, or comes to his office. So that um, uh, just as doctors, it's part of the profession of medicine that when you discover something, a solution to patients' problems, you make that known to your peers. So there's an inherent openness to, in the very definition, of professionalism. So how can you, the whole concept is this code should be uh, able to be communicated to other doctors for their use. If the code, uh, say, performs a calculation, uh, taking various things into consideration, uh, patient's condition and so forth, uh, that then produces a, a good solution for the, for the physician to use. So the, the concept of code being open, being uh, like medical knowledge, uh, that uh, you don't try to patent, of course some doctors have tried that, but uh, the patent office has really not been very cooperative with them in that regard. Uh, so the whole concept of, of the code being available to anyone who thinks they can use it. Uh, so that, was part of this total pattern of looking at uh, software and uh, information systems in the same way that you look upon one doctor uh, calling up another doctor and asking, I've got this patient and I can't quite figure out what the diagnosis might be, and the other doctor confers with him. So that, uh, that 
the software itself, which is an expression of how a physician is thinking through uh, and assembling information on a particular case, that that should be readily available to others, other doctors as well. That, so these are bits and pieces that if you want the philosophy behind what was uh, driving, first of all, Department of Health and Human Services uh, people who uh, uh, funded this effort. And then it was behind uh, uh, Ted O'Neill in trying to implement that and have a standard capability that would run on any hardware. So all of this, of course, uh, was contrary to the bi prevailing business models in the computer industry. Uh, also, the prevailing organization models in federal agencies. And that's <laughs> where all the friction occurred in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Because um, the, uh, the, the data processing people, that famous old word, data processing, their reason is you come to me with your requirements, uh, spelled out in tremendous detail, and then I will develop something and deliver it to you. Well, uh, and secondly, uh, I am the sole source of providing because I'm the data processing people of this agency. Uh, it's my career advancement. Uh, in, in the VA, in the, um, I remember having some heart-to-heart -heart conversations with the people on what was it, the second floor. So you mm. were on the sixth floor and they were on the second floor. And uh, their point was, we've got to understand our, our perspective. Maybe we, um, here in, uh, in the data processing, um, uh, and our view is that um, we've got 160, 170 hospitals out there, and that um, every one of us has the potential of going out and being a data processing manager in one of these hospitals. So uh, we just want to uh, have the doctors get together a, a big justification for a huge contract in which we can go out and contract for hospital information systems that they will put in all these hospitals. And then we will go out and be the, the, the manager of that hospital uh, system. So that was the mind, that told me that was the actual mindset. And, uh, but the department of, uh, uh, the, the, um, at that time, the, the chief medical director and his people uh, couldn't come up with these requirements that would, uh, they'd take the Congress and get a huge appropriations for. Uh, so that was, that was the loggerhead, and that, that was the resistance. Um, whereas uh, Ted was, his idea was we'll, we'll get some many computers out in the field and, and, and let the people uh, begin uh, actually working with uh, a month programmer, uh, begin building the systems they need. And then they could be com uh, among the different doctors in the VA, they could compare and say, well, uh, the system you developed is missing this, that, and oh yeah, it's missing, let's put it in. So uh, it was in a sense that that Cephone, Ted was able to get, uh, uh, what was it, about 20 systems put in. Uh, and then, of course, the, um, shall we say, the less than ethical way of doing things, <laughs> uh, uh, they trumped up charges against him <clears throat> to get him put under investigation. And he was the, uh, Another thing, if you look back in the history, it turns out that the, uh, it was just at the time that inspector generals were being put into federal agencies, and um, the, uh, shall we say, the, uh, uh, the top uh, people in the VA decided, well, uh, let's, uh, we know this is coming, so let us choose our own friend and set up uh, in Inspector General's office uh, before it's a requirement. And the, the friend, needless to say, was uh, having received a, uh, an upgrade in salary and so forth, was, uh, was expected to, uh, you might say, uh, be um, 
be appreciative of that <laughs> in case in case the, the you know the, the the pointers started coming at that at that person. So um, uh, quid pro quo, uh, and so they said, well, now that we have our own friend as uh, Inspector General, let's let's get rid of Ted O'Neill, put him under investigation, um, and. Um, but needless to say, the people in the Department of Health and Human Services who saw this happening and knew what, what was going on, they immediately asked for Ted to be detailed to the Department of Health and Human Services. So, you know, it just, but uh, that, that was the lean time in which computers were pulled out of the 20 or so facilities and put in a warehouse in Chicago, which is... Uh, uh, warehouses in Chicago are dangerous places. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. um, uh, but in any event, um, uh, fortunately, the um, uh, the press did some uh, writing on that, and people would say, "Why have you got all these computers in a in a warehouse? You know, computers are not designed to just sit in warehouses. You know, this is uh, I mean, it, it uh, sort of jangled people's thinking." And uh, Paul Schaefer, uh, the surgeon at the Washington VA Hospital, he uh, uh, happened to be chairman of the National Association of VA Physicians. And it turned out that um, uh, those 20 computers that had been put out for good purposes um, happened to have been uh, each of the member of the board of directors of the, in a, uh, of the National Social Security Physicians had one of those computers in this hospital and it was being pulled out. So uh, it didn't take Paul long to convince them that this was not right. And uh, with uh, that strength behind him, he was able to convince Congress to look into this and the rest, you know, sort of worked in a very, uh, uh, in, in bringing this to the surface and then things started happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's just a snapshot. Uh, one point I would make uh, is that um, a lot of people participated, a lot of people saw the reasonableness of what was being attempted. And in their own little way, sometimes big way, they, behind the scenes, uh, uh, interacted. The, um, for instance, in the Office of Management and Budget, um, people there pulled the chain of the, um, uh, of the VA when they were uh, trying to sort of put another plan in place rather than Ted's. Um, they had to explain um, but uh, they'd made the mistake of uh, some technical, and this is classic, some technical features of the way they had planned their, their, their system simply didn't meet OMB uh, uh, guidelines, and therefore they were stalled. And that enabled the time for Congress then uh, and Representative Sonny Montgomery, who was chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, uh, who was, he was also on Department of Defense uh, 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 Committee in Congress. Uh, as a senior congressman, he put his foot down uh, very strongly, and uh, that provided the opening for the DHCP to emerge. But that's, that's a short summary. Uh, the concept I mentioned is that an awful lot of people, and I could go on, uh, I mean, take me a while to uh, pull up hopefully many of those names, but people who were not in the VA, but who saw what was going on, and who stepped in just at the right time to um, have an influence that then gradually opened this thing up and enable it to grow. So um, uh, that's but the, the one one thought which has to be kept in mind is that the whole idea is software that supports physician 
interaction with patients and data uh, and fellow colleagues uh, should be flexible and open enough so that physicians in performing their professional collegial interaction should be supported rather than uh, continually tripping over proprietary rights and contract uh, limitations and so forth. So that's, I, I think, is part of uh, a fundamental issue. Thank you very much. Thank you.